I've covered a whole lot of racing games in the last couple of months, but there's one thing I always wanted to say about this series. It's not a racing game series, and I do not count that goofy ass spin-off. Driver as a series, for the longest time, has been something I would call driving mission games, or in this case of the classics, a car chase simulator. Since Driver 1 and 2 were both heavily inspired by a lot of classic car chases in movies from the 70s and 80s, like say Bullet with its intense car chase around San Francisco, or the lead developer's first movie movie ever called The Driver. Hence why a lot of focus was put into its writing, mission, cinematics, and car physics. Even arguably becoming the first game with a cinema director mode, something we see in current day as a norm in almost every single genre. And then comes the Dark Ages. Driver 3, some of you may have heard of the event that was called The Driver Gate. That time when Atari tried to bribe a lot of review outlets to give Driver 3 high scores, only for everything to backfire and get exposed to the public. I forgot this was also the first game to try and challenge the impossible hill we know as GTA, adding more on foot sections and gunfights, followed by the next game Driver Parallel Lines, which had doubled down on the GTA-like aspects and arguably made a lot of improvements. There were several titles made after, but let's jump to the one you're here for. Three months after the release of Parallel Lines, Reflection would become Ubisoft Reflections, getting sold by the previous owner Atari. Under Ubisoft's ownership, Reflection worked on their next major title, Driver San Francisco. As the name suggests, the game takes place exclusively in a single city, just like Parallel Lines New York. Unlike that game, however, San Francisco would completely ditch any on-foot sections. In its place is a new phase mechanic and as what you're seeing here, real-life car brands, a first and last to the franchise. After five years of development, the game finally opened to the public and it got quite the positive reaction. Well, except for the Wii version. Many positive receptions citing the great sandbox and new features as great innovations, earning the game awards such as the best driving game in 2011 by Machinima and nominations by Kotaku, G4 and Game Critic Awards. On the other hand though, the game got a lot of criticism from a lot of its older fans which had been split with one side disliking the game for ditching the old gritty atmosphere with the over the top mechanics and on the other side the fans who liked the return of the driving focused gameplay. But here I am making this video to sort of get my thoughts sorted out out with this game. Is it really as great of a game as I thought it was and possibly use this as a jumping point to discover the rest of the Driver series? Driver San Francisco brings us the return of John Tanner, our main protagonist from Driver 1, 2 and 3. His partner Jones and Tanner's sworn nemesis from Driver 2 and 3, Jericho. As the prologue begins we get to see Tanner, now no longer working as an undercover cop, overseeing Jericho's transfer in his 70s Dodge Challenger. The plot then kicks in as Jericho's henchman enact their plans so Jericho can escape from custody, with Tanner and Jones on the scene. They would chase down Jericho until suddenly he magically corners our protagonists and sends them into a crash resulting in Tanner falling into a coma. This is where the story takes place for the rest of the game. It's certainly a very unique idea to have a game take place entirely inside the head of a comatose character, yet it's also a good idea to sort of excuse having some illogical powers and visuals they would introduce here. Prime example Whenever you enter the shift ability, you also see Tanner's eye as you see things from his perspective, and you can see those things at the hospital that tracks heartbeats. It's a neat detail for the game's UI visuals. Adding on top of the yellow and black aesthetic, which seems to be the main color for this release, followed by the game's car damage which can be pretty extensive as every car in the game are destructible with varying health bars for every car. And the amount of traffic along with pedestrians creates a lot of spectacles, as the true main challenge of this game is traffic dodging and routing for any situation as the game is littered with a ton of alleys and unconventional roads for effectiveness. Though unlike Driver 3 or Parallel Lines, you can't really run into pedestrians here, taking away part of the challenge to avoid the Cobb wanted level altogether. Even Tanner's movements and animation are quite detailed which you can see whenever you drive in first person. Unfortunately, the same cannot be said regarding Tanner's mind. As he fights his way out of the coma, we get to discover how much his mind is fragmented as each area of the map being locked off is representative of Tanner's state of mind. Once we do unlock the whole map, we get to explore the entire range of San Francisco, with every single road, dirt, alley, and sidewalk open to explore, and used for any situation you find yourself in. Granted, some parts of the map can feel a bit too samey, with some exception being mostly landmarks and unique areas. Which brings us to the game's main progression, as Driver SF is split into multiple chapters, each 
separated by a collection of main story missions. While a lot of the main story focuses on Tanner's obsession on Jericho and his own health in the real world, a lot of the side content tends to get really wacky. Showcases just how much creative freedom the writers get with this premise. As Tanner shifts into people and takes control of their cars on the streets, experiencing the daily lives or rather his perception of people's daily lives, which is a lot of wacky car-based chases and action. Guess all his years of being a wheelman and undercover cop has shaped his mind into this weird car nut who gets high from high octane car chases. As Tanner possesses people, he temporarily takes on both the personality and memory of said person, allowing him to behave similarly as the person he's possessing while still being, well, him. It can result in some pretty wacky conversations. Lauren, I have a confession. That's Robert, my boss. I love him, and I'm leaving you, and we're taking the money from the company account. What? You did steal the money? Well, see, as far as the cops are concerned, you stole the money. Robert sent them an email. He thinks of everything. So not only does she leave him for another man, she pins the fucking theft on him. <laughs> she doesn't belong to the streets, she belongs in fucking jail. Phew. How about that? Could have been nasty. I'm waiting for an explanation. Sorry, I don't have time for one. Jenna, I really like you, you know? And I was hoping you liked me for more than my car and stuff. Charlie, you win this race, and I'm yours. Oh, God. If you're listening, I've never asked for anything before. With how gritty and serious the earlier games are, it's kind of weird to see Tanner be this jovial and funny guy, especially in contrast with his personality in Driver 3. The personality Tanner can get is varied just as much as the type of events he can do, which can go from the basic point-to-point -point mission with a time limit or while getting chased, the usual street races both on and off-road, escaping pursuers which can be either hostile NPCs or the police, the usual Ubisoft tailing missions, doing X amount of stunts within a time limit, and they even got a defense section, which was probably the most boring mission out of them all. I can appreciate them for being unique, but did they really have to make it last so long? It kinda got old pretty fast since it's basically just shift into a car and destroy the oncoming enemies for a couple of minutes. For some of the previously mentioned chase sequences, I like the options given as you either have to simply outrun the enemy or use the shifting capability to destroy them. Hell, you can even do it to the opponents in street racing missions. You know what, let's try the method you suggested. If you can't win, kill them. That is beautiful, man. No, no, no. <laughs> and the opponent retired. You can't beat him, just kill him, man. The best strategy ever. Does the race instantly finish once you've taken them out? <laughs> it does! All opponents retired. Oh, I've never seen that before. And you can tell just how much the developers love the series with the inclusion of references to the old game, with a blast from the past mission taking you back to the old Driver 1 parking area test. Pretty useful to check if you either still got the same skill issue as whenever you first played Driver 1, or if there's some improvements. But if you don't really pay much attention to the side missions, this change in attitude can still be seen with the interaction between Tanner and Jones throughout the main story, as they discover a string of plots tied with Jericho to finally apprehend them. Catching Jericho ain't an easy task as each trail continues to lead into an even bigger plot and paints a clearer picture of what's going on. Or not as the reasoning for everything that happens inside Tanner's head are heavily influenced by events happening in the real world. Thank god Jones kept the news turned on or the game's main story might have ended up being quite bare bones. Everything that is essentially Jericho's plan is just Tanner's way of making sense of the information he's taking in from the real world. And it all eventually builds up to the penultimate climax as Tanner finally realizes he is trapped within his own head and the Jericho he's been chasing is nothing more than a nightmare taunting him constantly. With each story progression we got a short cinematic in the form of a TV show recap, a great spin on paying homage to the original games being inspired by movies, though that's not to say there are no movie homages in this game as well. With how many stunts and collectibles are around, movies are scattered throughout the game. Though speaking of movies, the cutscenes in this game 
game look pretty good. While some of the movements can be janky and some of the lighting can get a bit funky at times, it does help sell the idea that everything is not right. Which progresses even further to the point where even side mission characters start to address Tanner directly and even more nightmares in the form of Jericho spawning everywhere with a similar power as Tanner's. And in the process to fight back against Jericho, you'll be phasing into a lot of cars so surely Tanner got some base selection of cars in his head, right? Well sadly, even in his head, Tanner can't materialize Porsches. So I guess the EA exclusivity deal is a canon event in the driver universe. There's some roughs and 31 other car brands and around 140 cars in total with some models from the Abarth, A35, Gallardo, Solstice and a bunch of other cars that you get to use all for free assuming you can find one to phase in or if it's used in a mission. And the car's handling seems to be a mix between a sim and arcade with how cars tend to behave somewhat realistically and yet still be arcadey enough to easily turn. If a car is unavailable via side missions and it's not available on the roads then a good alternative is to go and check the garage to purchase cars using the currency of this game being willpower. Once a car is purchased, you can basically just spawn in one by selecting the car in the garage again. And while you're here, there's also options such as the upgrades. But don't be fooled, this isn't upgrades for the cars, but rather Tanner's own abilities. Though if I have to be honest, you don't really have to do any upgrades for Tanner, as the game is already quite easy as it is. It is a bit funny with how they introduced the ability to throw cars exclusively for one mission, but hey, for the final mission we get to actually drive in the real world as Tanner makes sense of everything he's learned and goes after Jericho's true plan. And once again, Jones coming in clutch lending his Camaro for the final chase before ending the story with Jericho apprehended once again. And so ends the story of Driver San Francisco. But calling this the end of the story would not be the case. Right before Tanner manages to catch Jericho, it was already too late as he had managed to pull off his plan to break someone out of prison, which we never really see what happens next. This may have been what was planned for a sequel for the next Driver game, which sadly got rebooted and changed into what we know as the first Watch Dogs game. But I guess the only thing we can do now is accept this as the ending of the series, I guess. And at the end of it all, the game sends you back to Comatose Tanner with the open world and any unfinished content and collectibles left to discover. In hindsight, it's surprising how much this game, despite being an open world Ubisoft title, hasn't fallen to the same problems a lot of their open world world games fell into at the time with pointless collectibles and the towers. The goddamn towers. But in the end, the story of Driver San Francisco is weirdly prophetic for the series, because it's now a franchise in a comatose state, with Reflection Studios last I heard mostly doing support work for Watch Dogs and the crew. And if I had the choice, would I bring back Driver in current day climate? Because one could argue Driver could be assassinated in the writing department, with how bad stories have become in the last few years in general. So I don't know if I would, but what about you? Would any of you watching this bring back the series with everything going on? But regardless, until Ubisoft remembers it got this franchise laying doorman, we'll just have to wait until it wakes up from its own comatose dreams.